Hello, hello, and welcome. Strength Hub 407 Sessions back again. It's me, Dave, with Sam. We've got a special guest today. We've got Keegan Smith. How are you, sir? You well? Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Not bad. Oh, pleasure. How are you? How's things? What's life saying? All good over here. Yeah, we just uh, finally ordered some strength training equipment. So one of the things about the small island that I moved to is that a couple of people with a little bit of gear, but um, yeah. there's basically no no gym. There's a tiny little hotel gym, and then there's a thing at the church of like a, a broken treadmill and a rower or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen the experiment to not have access to a squat rack. I think it's the longest you know time in 20 years I've been without touching a barbell. Yeah, um, wow. yeah, I've but, seen all your like hybrid bag like sandbag kind of uh, pull-up series and uh we can see your stuff behind you right but um yeah yeah this is this is the gym at the moment so the old dip frame i was gonna say i think I, I was just thinking back i think it's been uh just over a year since the malaga retreat right marbella retreat yeah exactly yeah it was yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty Feb. much yeah yeah and then you so, went to the states after yeah yeah that was when i yeah first went and connected with ben so just after visiting with sunny in the in the uk yep uh, yeah seems a long time ago the world's changed yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair um yeah so great right, pleasure for having you on um and let's uh find out well a really interesting i know your story right i know you i know to a degree um i think really interesting for listeners to to hear kind of um well wait, we could talk more about where you're at now and what you're trying to do but kind of like your your sporting background and then how that fed into kind of your coaching processes and then kind of fle fleeing the, the successful nest to venture on your own and do what you're doing. So, um, yeah, the floor is yours, man. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, I guess like a lot of coaches, I started as a kind of failed athlete. I had my first overuse injury at about 10 years old and, uh, I had the heel one, like the growth bone thing in the heel, um, Schumann's, I think it's called, or I don't know. But um, I had that one, and then I had just about all the other syndromes and whatnot that you could get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of stuff. Um, so I was also had the, the fortune of being told I was too slow to make any representative teams and too weak. And I was playing field hockey, which is a sport not really known for its extreme athleticism. Mm -hmm. The top guys now are pretty sharp, but, you know, it's a small, it's a minority sport. So to be uh, missing teams for lack of athleticism, um, shows the level that I was at um, and I guess that's where a lot of people get into strength training and then yeah that sort of became a bit more of my passion than the hockey itself uh, over time yep. so yep. yeah I uh, kept going down that path and uh, you played in Europe right you were down uh... yeah I just uh, I, I went to I actually played in England as soon as I finished uni, well, I quit uni after three and a half years. I couldn't stand it any longer and uh, moved to England. I played for Reading Hockey Club, uh, who were one of the top teams at the time. And um, I coached Henley when I was like 21 years old. I was coaching a men's team, which was a really good experience as well. I would coached a little bit in Australia as well, but I guess I've always kind of coached and coaching hockey was, was definitely really good for me. And then, uh, yeah, I played in Germany as well for a few months. So kind of almost semi-professionally as much as you can get there in uh in hockey yep um so my training was mostly focused around trying to be you know faster and i did eventually you know clock some of the fastest times on the sprints and, and i ran a, a 16 beep which you have to have reasonable speed to kind of get to those mm -hmm. higher endurance um feats as well you have to have a bit of speed reserve i guess to be able to yep, uh, yep. they're not world breaking scores but uh yeah, I, I definitely got some results out of strength training, but I think I also realized it was a bit of a double-edged sword where you can you can get tight in certain areas. And I think that contributed to the compartment syndrome and some hip flexor issues that I had. Yeah. Um, I think strength science was pretty poorly understood, but I, I kind of knew that from early on as well, like working with the rugby league players. <clears throat> I was really it was really clear that they had a lot of dysfunction and they'd lost a lot of ability. Like the, the young guys were so much more athletic, just naturally fluid. And, you know, they were mm -hmm. still playing basketball and playing touch footy and playing soccer. And, and then they were, you know, coming into these professional programs and you could see just a, a rapid deterioration of their fluidity and overall athletic ability. So 
um, yeah, I was always trying to kind of solve that for myself and then for these professional players. And I guess I just, I loved it from, from pretty early on, even, I think I first wanted to lift maybe when I was 10 years old and my brother got some weights yep. when I was about 12 and this I started, one, right? started playing that, around with them. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. With little, <laughs> yeah. little fairy dumbbells. Um, and I was, yeah, I was naturally like a real skinny kid and I was like that social side of things as well. Like, you know, just wanting to be attractive to the opposite sex, you know, going through puberty and, and just mm -hmm. being the run. It wasn't, yeah. wasn't the easiest thing either. So I guess, that was part of the part of the story as well of why I fell in love with weights. Yep. Um, and yeah, it's been a it's been a great journey. I can't uh, can't thank the iron enough, really. Yeah, no fair, man. Well, that's um. And then from from a coaching standpoint, uh, spell in France and then back to Australia. Correct? Well, I started during university. I went and got some work experience uh, with the Parramatta Eels. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad was the head coach there at the time, and Hayden Knowles was the, the strength coach who's gone on to, to work with a lot of the top teams. He was a great coach, very innovative and very open to experimentation. So when I was highly critical of what was going on, mm -hmm. he was really open to, to that and challenged me to implement things. And okay, mm -hmm. if you believe that's the truth and test it with this guy. And it was, it was a great experience. Um, so that experience at Para led to London Broncos. I went there, I did some massage for them when I first arrived and I was just before I was playing with Reading. Mm -hmm. And then I, I sort of quit hockey and worked for a season with the London Broncos at like 2022, 20, end up running the, the weights, um, not for the preseason, but sort of evolved into that role, um, sort of the weights and the rehab for them as like the assistant. Um, so that was kind of the experience that I got. Then I went back to Parramatta, worked a preseason with the NRL team, basically ran the gym in the NRL um, at like 22. Um, and that was, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. I had a bunch of experience and then I went traveling for, sort of six years uh, and then at the end of that I, I went to France Catalan Dragons I was the that was my first head of a program role I went from being a professional backpacker to being head <laughs> of a um, which was quite a quite a big transition as well that I wasn't too sure about but yeah we I had a couple of good years in France and then that opened the door to sort of go to the to the Roosters um, so I applied to go there with the uh, in the NRL and uh, yeah two years with the with the Sydney Roosters first year was full time and the second year was was a bit of a uh, bit of in and out bit of a mix up and then a uh, little bit of consulting since then with with rugby league but yeah that's pretty much the the rugby league uh, history yeah is it um was it at the roosters is that was that the first time that you'd um be linked up with sunny bill or did you work with him before no yeah no that was the first time i'd i'd met him was was there um, he had been in france but it was before before I was there, and um, yeah, I was a bit nervous with him coming in. Like, what am I going to do for for Sonny Bill? You know, he'd already, you know, won a World Cup and 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 won a Premiership, and you know, had this massive reputation. And then he was uh, just about to have a boxing fight, and he was four months post pec tear. So it was an interesting scenario. He'd been playing rugby in Japan, so he hadn't been doing much strength training inside of their system, pec tear boxing. Um, and then he was sort of expected to come back into rugby league and be the star. And uh, yeah, his first game wasn't, wasn't his best game. Um, and that gave, I guess, a bit of an opportunity where he was, I mean, he's always been really hungry, but he, from the start, he was really receptive and hungry to kind of improve his body and just see what, what was on offer. Um, and he was always like from my whole career, and he was the guy who was most ready to change behaviors. Like a lot of guys that interest information, but he was the guy who was ready to, ready to turn it into behavior and could actually do that as well. He has an exceptional ability for doing, um, and I, I just saw one of his things. Um, he's just retired from rugby, rugby league today. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the quotes was like, I, I have to learn things by doing them. And I think that's, that's what he did. And I think we're all like that, but he's just really aware of it. Um, mm. So he turns everything he wants to do into behavior, which yeah. I think is a great lesson for life and a great challenge to anyone, you know, regardless of the area that you want to excel in, if you can turn your ambition into behavior, then you get that feedback loop going and it might not be the right behavior, but you'll, you'll work it out a lot sooner and you'll refine yeah, things yeah. a lot sooner. So yeah, with the chance to work with Sonny was really amazing. What, what, what's what's his plan? So, sorry, Sam, what, what, what's his plan going forward? You know, is he focusing on like the boxing or is he just taking a step back and deciding? Yeah, it looks, looks like he's getting into the boxing. We, we haven't been chatting a lot lately. He's uh, working with a couple of other guys that I've, I've worked with sort of my intern there at the Roosters, Pat Lane has stayed on there as the, 
Uh, he's became, became the strength coach for their two premierships. He's still he's still on the staff there at the Roosters, but he, he's been working with with Sonny in his preparation now. And uh, Ben Roberts, who's also um, former NRL Super League uh, Kiwis player, he's uh, he's a strength coach now, and he's been working with us in real movement and, and doing some sessions with Sonny as well. So it's pretty cool to see uh, to see him working with those guys and getting really good feedback as well. So mm. uh, yeah, that's I guess what part of why I left rugby league was so I could do that, you know, like to have other coaches that I could, you know, send a player to or send an athlete to and, and be confident that they were going to get a five-star review or a, or a six-star review. You know, that's, that's kind of the goal of like Excel expectations. Yeah. yeah. So I was just going to say before, um, before we linked up at last, um, I came across what real movement was getting to for about 15, 16 months ago through Aaron and seeing it and seeing yeah, yeah. work together. And then obviously I think your social media stuff around with Sonny Bill doing that, that period where you were transitioning with him prepping him to go to the States. Correct. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. He signed with Toronto. Wolfpack. And, then, and then your stint with him and that was fully immersed. You guys, well, you documented it quite well, right? You were, and not just from a training perspective, I think you, which is against social norms. We're, we're touching it in a bit like around carnivore and, and, and all those kind of, uh, uh, I actually had my steaks this morning for breakfast and the bone broth this morning, as, good, you, man. Can, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> Looking good. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's um, let's cut to it with with real movement. Kind of, um, we've um, I've definitely implemented since uh, weekly uh, with clients and myself around um, the philosophy around training principles, as well as not just the, the other kind of questions it brings to light, but if you had an elevator pitch for real movement or now, is it now we would say formally ATG for coaches? Is this the, yeah, am I so correct? Yeah, talk a little bit about that as well. But yeah, I mean, real movement was like, what does a winning culture look like? How can you create, you know, what's the best culture I can create to be a part of? Um, I've been a part of rugby league teams and, and sporting teams, hockey teams, you know, all my life. And I was always kind of in search of, culture that was more committed and, and and just wanting to achieve its its best i guess uh, those cultures were great um, but at, at some point i didn't want to be a part of the alcohol i didn't want to be part of you know other things and i wanted to be you know, more serious about what i was trying to achieve and i wanted to find other people who were into that who wanted to have great businesses be really healthy um, be strong and i couldn't really find anything out there that was trying to do that and um, so you know i created it and and that's sort of yeah what I what I've been doing since I left full time rugby league 2014. Um, the transition to HCD for coaches is is a significant transition because I think that one of my frustrations with real movement is that I never really locked in on a training system. Like it was always about that culture for me and about like seeing change in people's beliefs and the way that they looked at themselves and looked at their training and their role in the world. You know, like I think. A lot of strength coaches and personal trainers kind of think, oh, I'm just a personal trainer. Or I'm just a strength coach. Where to me, it's one of the most important roles in society and humanity. Like if, if the human body is functioning well, then the opportunity for a great life is, is much greater than if it's not functioning well. So, um, you know, I, I really attach a lot of value to it. And I think I've done a good job of helping coaches to carry more of that energy into what they do. And the coaches that I work with have tended to, make more money, have more fun, um, you know, go on and work with pro teams or have gyms that do well. Um, but at the same time, like I've used lots of tools to do that with the, you know, with the juggling and the handstands and that kind of more abstract stuff that really bends the mind. And then, you know, I love old time strongman. I love strongman training. I love powerlifting. I love weightlifting. Yeah. I love gymnastics. Anyone who's followed my journey has seen that I've gone through like stages of doing all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, which I guess for coaches like you, who you know, for, or coaches who've been in the network, it sort of leaves them of like, well, I like it and I'm all in, but what the what do I do? Like, how does this actually work, and how do I implement this? I think that's, yeah. you know, and I haven't, I don't mind so much that I haven't given people great answers to that, but at the same time, I know that that's a big part of the reason why I haven't been able to create more of a global shift uh, in training in the way that. I, I want to, you know, mm -hmm. um, so yes. Yeah. yeah. I think you've got like a big full spectrum kind of, I just see it as an umbrella, right? You kind of from, for, for as a practitioner in terms of some of the principles about 
strength through range and these kind of underpinning things that form real movement and AT coaches. That wasn't anything I kind of, um, it was kind of, this is the, this is the limitations of the athlete or the client that you got work with them. It's not kind of looking at testing that. So that's where the, like it tested my belief system as a, as a practitioner and ultimately um, but some of the results from firsthand physically. And then some of the stuff I've implemented in the business has been from a performance side of things has been, uh, phenomenal but it's um yeah and then now formally atg coaches is launched this week what's the is this is this the first pr stunt you've done for uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty yeah. much i mean uh, i think joe rogan did the first one and then yeah uh, so we're number two we'll take, we'll take. pretty cool to like when i first saw atg you know i first saw ben and, and saw what atg was about and the Athletic Truth Group channel was a lot bigger at that stage in 2018. It was more of a focus. Um, I, I realized that they'd solved what I've been looking for. Like if that, that story of like, why does weight training not give, why is it not the fountain of youth that it should be? Like we know that muscle mass is key to longevity, but most people who weight train, actually they, you don't regain your youthful abilities. Like you don't become more childlike in your movement. And that's kind of what I was in search of. And I knew that, you know, Edo Portal was probably the best of like taking the Poliquin method and then turning it into like just being able to move well as a human. Mm -hmm. um, but it got so abstract that I couldn't really, I couldn't follow it down that path, you know, is sort of more into dancing and, and whatever. And it's, it's cool, but it's just not me. Like I'm more of that nuts and bolts athletic development. So when I saw what Ben was doing, I was like, this is it. Like, this is the thing that I've been looking for. His actual sequence of the knee stuff. I was literally like for months there, I'd been thinking about force curves, strength curves, how Polycom was training the arms um, and just why movements were selected in the way that they were selected. And then I saw Ben's sister. I'm like, this is exactly it. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the first coach I've seen that is sequencing this stuff correctly and knows how to go from any level of dysfunction to like, yeah. highest level of function that no one ever gets to in strength training like you can take thousands and thousands of professional athletes and and not have them be able to do a natural knee extension or a cc squat or a you know pumps to floor standing pike or you know a slant board um jefferson curl and touch the elbows to the feet like you're going to run through a lot of athletes before you find one that can can do that yep. where now it's like created systematically within that system so it was like, I was all in behind it from the start. Like I wasn't anything part of the business or anything, but I just told everyone about it. Like you need to have yeah. a look at this. Pretty much everyone I know has at some stage been a member of ATG online. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a good thing. And I was just doing it because I knew that it was better than anything out there. And I didn't have the ability to systemize things to that extent. Um, so yeah, at some stage it was like, well, you know, just recently, I guess I was having a conversation with Ben of like, this isn't really working like you sending coaches to real movement and them getting real movement sort of ATG certified, whatever that is. It's just too confusing in the modern world of like over marketing and over exposure to a million ideas. Like we need this to be, to be simple and clear. So like, well, what, what, what is real movement anyway? Like it's exactly the same thing that ATG is trying to do in terms of training, changing the world, the way, the way the world moves and trains. Um, so yeah, like that's, it was a big, sort of big day, I guess, the first day where I sort of decided, yeah, like this is the way to go. Um, but I ran it past, you know, staff members at Real Movement and, and lots of members and the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. Like if you had the chance to have a brand shouted out by Joe Rogan and, and Mark Bell or not, like, and it's effectively doesn't change the product in any negative way, but it probably gives like a clearer path to the, to the coach and to the, you know, to the customer, then, you know, I, you know, anyone in business or any, you know, 99 people out of 100 are going to say, yeah, go with the, you know, go with yeah. the Joe Rogan. But it was, it was like already really clear that that's the direction that training should go in. Like it's, it's a different philosophy of strength training. It's a better philosophy. Like it's, for me, it's like going from the Nokia to the smartphone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I found so what I, in terms of implementing as a practitioner in the private sector in London, um, from a philosophy standpoint and implement it, it was obviously a micro dose of certain movements, whether that's the, let's say, Pollockman step, Patrick step, Jefferson. But, and that comes down to me as the coach with the relationship I have with the, the client to then influence them. But then I run a two, three, now I'm at a point with most clients have at least done a, 
ATG lunge, Jefferson, cyclist, or like kind of knee hab stuff like that. But it's there's like the questioning perspective, which the commercial product that you guys have is is on point. But from you know, as you were saying with the real movement, it's kind of like this works for me. How do I commercially make this? How do I implement this in the business? Well, firstly, not some of my clients want to do certain things that okay, you know, it, it seems a bit more gimmicky or whatever. So it's building that in. I've got to a point with it now, but um, it took some time, you know, I think in terms of, I think the biggest thing I found from real movement was just kind of questioning the norms. And I think that leads to kind of the, the whole process, right? You know, there's, there's a whole business side. I think there's also a thing where you guys, it's quite frowned upon to talk about finances, I think in, in this profession and be proud to maybe have a business that's successful. I think there's kind of a hypocrisy around that, but, um, and then also, the, the extremes, I, I quoted on the Instagram thing about your, uh, and it's a living product, right? You are the product that your your demographic should basically aspire to. You should be the, the, the leader in that Physi- physically and and um, with, with with your approach. But um, I think quick, I'm very curious to know where you're at now with um, Carnival. What's that in your life? What does that look like? How I, I in Spain, they were told Dave, we're, we're at this retreat and I turn up, uh, late i had a, a funeral thing before and i came and everyone's there trying to be alpha as possible right so we're eating meat and there's this open the fridge there's a pig's head in the fridge <laughs> <laughs> and there's a there's a vat on the side with <laughs> pig's feet brewing away with some salt and i'm it didn't it didn't look glamorous and it did not smell glamorous but uh yeah and then you have we have a shot of uh pig's broth or whatever you want to call it and then just gnawing a feet and everyone's everyone's there pretend <laughs> pretending that it's uh there's no no issues and you don't want to say anything because you want to fit in right but um but since now i use i have australian bone broth every day right in the morning and then i still try and have a steak like four, four did you try the feet there i chewed a bit mate i'm not gonna pretend i ate a whole foot that was <laughs> not... <laughs> and yeah, just for the record i haven't bought any since the the smell but um yeah I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to know. Yes. What, what, what it's like. So, I mean, like the, it sounds crazy and most, most people aren't eating those things, but glycine and proline are like commonly deficient amino acids and they're key for connective tissue. So mm-hmm. this is again at the heart of the ATG system is like, are you training the muscle or are you training the connective tissue? And to what extent, like that is the key division that's not being made. We just started our extreme range strength um, course with, with inside the ATG for coaches just kicked mm-hmm. off yesterday. And the first lesson is about that differentiation between is this a movement that is going to change the connective tissues and cause a really anabolic response, or is it a movement that is going to cause neurological rewiring and is going to be muscle dominant? And our, you know, in my 20 years of research and, and being a coach at the top level and working with athletes, etc. I didn't know how to differentiate those exercises, you know, so you can think, well, this is a biceps exercise and this is a bicep long head dominant. And this is a, you know, et cetera. But that distinction between whether it's more connective tissue and more anabolic or more muscle focused um, and neurological rewiring is like a key distinction. That's the thing that ATG solved. And I was like, oh, fuck, finally, someone's like put it together. And I was like, kind of had it in my head and I was playing around with it, but I didn't really I didn't really get it and I probably didn't believe it enough to, to go all in on it where he'd gone all in on it and he was using it with pro athletes and it was working. Um, so in parallel with that, to answer your question, if you're doing these remodeling structural exercises like the sissy squat, like the slam or Jefferson, where they're extremely connective tissue dominant and they're going to cause a, a, a serious inflammatory response, then you want to have the stuff in the bloodstream that the blood, you know, that the body wants to repair that with. So it's, it's like, you know, um, oysters being rich in zinc. If, if, they're, if they're grown in an environment that doesn't have any zinc in it, then they're not rich in zinc. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the same for all of those minerals, like the soil has to actually have it. Is the plant rich in magnesium? Well, it depends on the soil that it was grown in. Mm-hmm. You know, selenium for Brazil nuts, all this stuff. So it's the same for your body when you do these anabolic exercises and you're tearing your body to bits is the stuff in the bloodstream to fix this in the way that the body would like to fix it. Glycine and proline are commonly deficient amino acids and they're the connective tissue, um, the key amino acids for connective tissue integrity. So that's why we're eating the pig feet because, you know, like builds like when you eat the the joints of a lamb or whatever, then you're putting in the nutrients that the body is literally craving. And a lot of people will say that they actually do crave those things because they are probably deficient in those amino acids. Like if you crave liver, 
and you really enjoy you know liver then you probably need more b12 and you probably need more of the the things that are there you know in the liver and our, our ancestors valued these foods very highly we've been indoctrinated like I, I didn't grow up eating these foods either i i learned that through western a price you know paul check put me on to western a price the price pottinger foundation and that research is just phenomenal the work that western price did and the pot, Pottinger research uh, is just the best research that's been done in nutrition as far as I've seen. It was done in the 1930s. And I think we've, you know, progressed very little in terms of the way that we're telling, well, we've actually regressed significantly, the way we're telling athletes to eat. Um, and that's why, you know, we had a massive competitive advantage at the Roosters. You know, we, we won the competition. We won the regular season, the grand final, the club championship, the world championship, um, you know, the world club challenge, the... Uh, we set an all-time, the team set an all-time defensive record for zero scorelines and opposing players were literally asking our team, like, what are you guys doing? Like, why are you so much better than us? Um, and, you know, I didn't have all the things I have now. I know I do a lot better job in that role now, um, but there are a lot of things that I, I just hadn't systemized enough that, that, you know, they were there in one form or another. Yeah. And this kind of ancestral nutrition is like a, it's a, it's a huge thing. Like a lot of players will really no, notice a, a significant difference and to get a significant difference with an elite athlete means you've, you've done something. You know? yeah, yeah, you're only looking for three to 5%. If you're three to 5% better than the opposition, then, you know, you're Usain Bolt. Like you just, you don't lose very often. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like, yeah, you're just looking for where, where do you find that three to 5%? If you, that's, that's really all you need to, your job as a coach is to find that. And a lot of coaches diminish their role and say, well, we all push, pull, you know, hinge, squat. So, you know, basically we all do the same. I've heard that from coaches who work 20 years in pro sport. They say, yeah, basically we're all doing the same thing. Like, I'm glad we're playing your team this week. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just that attitude is like, how, how are you, you know, where are those three to 5% coming from in that, in that environment? Mm -hmm. They're not coming from the placebo effect of the coach thinking I've got the best program out there, uh, yeah, which we know, know is super you know, important as well. The emotional side of training, um, mm -hmm is vital too so yeah the carnivore at the moment still very much meat dominant not religiously the odd bit of uh broccoli or asparagus or something will sneak in there um and then depending on depending yeah. on the yeah. discipline i might have some of the you know the wife's treats or the kids leftovers you know once a week yeah. it's i'm not uh i'm not being uh, a monk at the moment i do have that ability from time to time but it's difficult to do it with lots of things at the same time so yeah um, on the on the exactly. topic of the food, can can we discuss um can we discuss the fasting as well? Because I know that's something that when I was um within the real movement as well, um I saw quite a lot of and it seemed to have quite a good benefit. But um could could, could you sort of discuss that in a bit of detail from from your point of view? Yeah, I mean there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff there, Dave. Like and you you would notice the buzz that that gets across the community mm. because it's a significant ritual to engage with and we're lacking these in modern culture we're lacking these rituals these rites of passion passage that's part of the reason why the crossfit open on at the moment like it people turn their lives inside out for it there's no there's no money there's no nothing it's just they just want these rituals these rites of passage these opportunities to connect to test themselves an ice bath gives you that opportunity wim hof breathing gives you that opportunity mm -hmm. um, fasting gives you that opportunity the mental side of it is is huge and, and the same goes with everything that we talk about, like the physical side is important and the mental side is important. And so from that cultural perspective, very, very powerful. Um, Self-empowerment, discipline, like if you believe you have the ability to stop eating for seven days, like you're going to have a different perspective on, on yourself for the rest of your life. If you can stop for 24 hours, you know, when I first came across the idea of intermittent fasting and, and fasting, it's like, I don't think I'd, you know, I get up and eat and then, you know, eat through the day and then just stop eating to sleep, you know, like that was, and I had yeah. huge blood sugar issues um, because of sports nutrition in my early twenties, et cetera. So I didn't realize it really until I went more paleo and then keto and then carnivore and then gradually understood it. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there physically, physiologically as well. It's been part of, you know, every religious practice and, different warriors have done it in different ways, like different spiritual practices. If, if just looking at it from that purely athletic physiological perspective, you don't want to do it while you're like training super hard. We did, we did them at the roosters. They actually did them when I was a consultant with them. Um, and it was more so that mental thing of like, can you actually discipline yourself to do this? Yeah. You're hungry. So what get on with it. Yeah. Um, 
and those those experiences are important. But we also know that animals will fast themselves if they're sick, right? So it does give the body a chance to clean itself out. It does take energy to digest food. And if you stop using the digestive tract, then the microvilli have the chance to, you know, rebuild, reline. If there's just if there's inflammation in the gut, then that has a chance to settle itself down and you can start to absorb nutrients again. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, someone might want to fast. Um, the autophagy, you know, recycling, damaged proteins from within the cells if the protein if protein is always high then that probably doesn't happen um, very much so yeah I'm, I'm a big believer in intermittent fasting the longer ones are more so a mind game more so a test like more so an off-season thing maybe around concussions there's some interesting stuff about get around getting in deep ketosis uh, for, around concussions and you know having ketone bodies in the blood after a concussion seems like a really smart thing to do from the research that, that I've seen. Uh, so I think there are some therapeutic, I, I would also use it around muscle injury potentially as well. Um, but yeah, I think like the, the mental side is probably the, the biggest one, Dave. I don't know if you, have you given it a go at all yourself as yet or what's your longest what's your experience I've so far? Is, longest I've probably got is about 20. Yeah. I've never, I've, I've never managed 24, unfortunately. I've, I've, to be fair, I've never sat down and said, I'm going to do 24, but the longest I've probably gone is about 20. I think so I din dinner to dinner. Dinner to dinner is pretty doable. Like you go and eat a big yeah. dinner yeah. and then just go, yeah, I'm not going to eat till dinner tomorrow. Like I've done that. I've done that with dry fasting, sauna at the start to like max out the sauna, no water, <laughs> and then survive for the sauna at the end. <laughs> that's pretty intense but there's there's russian research um and so like yeah eastern block research that says that like that their reports say that cancer cells die and they've had like people with terminal cancers i'm not making that claim but it's interesting research and dry fasting is is interesting so you apply that fluid stress and then you apply heat stress and then you know the weakest only the strongest shall survive and the, the cancer cells aren't actually that strong they just thrive in a certain environment that environment of high sugar um the environment of high, high glutamine etc um so basically they're just creating an environment where the weak cells die and so by definition you don't want to be doing that all the time like you don't want to be killing off heaps of cells all the time you basically kill off your whole unit whole immune system and then it, it rebuilds and bounces back as soon as you start eating again so it's like a reset for uh immune uh, autoimmune type stuff um, it's it's really interesting area to get into obviously like i'm not making any medical claims but it, as someone who's trying to improve themselves like yeah i'm going to look in every area to try and find that you know that three to five percent and i'm one of those guys that's crazy enough to to test it out <laughs> and just question whether what people have been doing all the you know what has, has what everyone has been doing you know is that the best or is it something else and I'm pretty much always inclined to think it's something else. And we just, you know, I'm interested in finding what that something else is like so far. So good. You know, I found a massive liberation with uh, doing 24 hour fast. I did probably did like six or seven consecutive. It's Monday, it's Sunday, Mondays, you know, we did 40 hours, right? You guys um, just been liberated from just like thinking that you need this the whole time. And I like food, man. I like <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's kind of like eating yourself and going. <laughs> yeah. Everything shouldn't be suffering, but yeah. Um, and it's in like training through it or just um, yeah. how did you yeah. find how do you find training faster? Uh like it's kind of there, there is a caffeine intake. I'm not gonna beat around the bush on that. Let's definitely get through. Um yeah, I just felt like I think the biggest shift I had when I when I I've done high periods of say carnivore to to a degree and, and around that and then the fasting stuff my body i think i just there was a lot of other stuff other variables psychological variables and other stuff going on in life but and stress and how my body was responding but i just felt inflamed the whole time and then a lot of stuff around my neck but when i kind of went to an extreme for a period it kind of just kind of everything kind of felt like a down regulated like yeah. i eat, i eat steak four mornings a week right for for breakfast and it's, i look forward to it It tastes great but i i i will honestly go on record saying i feel great like i feel just energized my body just feels like whether it there whether it's a the placebo level or whatever it is my body just feels like kind of just down regulated and then i'm kind of like good to go and obviously the satiety rate and it's good for me because then i stop eating more and throughout the day you know i fall for a bit but um 
But yeah. Charles, you know, Charles Poliquin and, and Vince Gironda kind of, they didn't, I'm sure they weren't the first ones to eat meat. Like a lot of traditional, if you look back at the old, what the, you pretty much had to back in the old days. Like if you lived in a cold climate, like what else is around? But yeah. I mean, Poliquin was a huge, you know, the meat and nuts breakfast was one of his biggest trademarks. He coached 286 Olympic medalists. Mm-hmm. There's, there's probably something to that. Like the fastest way to, you know, and this is if coaches are listening, the fastest way to improve the athleticism of, of an individual is to optimize their body composition and optimize their range of motion. If you can increase range of motion and you can improve body composition, then they're going to move a lot better. They're going to have much yeah. better muscle activation. Yeah. If you're wearing a five kilo vest and you do a vertical jump, what's your score going to be? You do a sprint. doesn't matter how well that's distributed over the body. Yeah. If, it's, if it's useless mass, yeah. then it's not, it's not going to help. So you take that weight vest off. I used to always, you know, explain it to the fat players, you know, and we had a lean team and we won, you know, so a lot of, co- a lot of teams won't test their players and they like, Oh, it doesn't really matter. Whatever. You know, Charles Polkin was a huge believer in body composition. He said, you're a fat fuck. If you don't have tricep, you know, if your tricep skin fold is more than your, your penis you know, skin, skin fold, <laughs> then you're a fat fuck. And, you know, these success leaves clues like Vince Gironda had, had the same kind of method. He told, Arnold that he was a fat fuck when he arrived to, to the US from, from Germany. And it's probably the best thing that Arnold could have heard for his bodybuilding and acting career, uh, or at least bodybuilding. But, um, you know, I'm not inventing any of this stuff. It's, it's just, uh, we've been, there's so many competing perspectives, you know, the, the dominant voice in sports nutrition and, and, and personal training fitness at the moment is saying that, you know, it's just calories in calories out, or if we want to get more nuanced than that, then it's, um, if it fits your macros, you know, as long as you're yeah. hitting your protein intake for the day, then, you know, they say, oh yeah, protein calories count differently. If it, you know, calorie in calories out, but protein counts differently, which already negates the initial, you know, um, idea. Yeah. But yeah. then I, I've, I offered $10,000 and I'll, I'll still leave this on the table. If someone wants to eat soy protein, uh, vegetable, vegetable oil, um, and high fructose corn syrup for 12 months prove it you know if it's macros if it's if it fits your macros then prove it you know live on that for 12 months and and we'll, i'll give you ten thousand dollars i'll be happy to pay someone ten thousand dollars <laughs> that. As as they don't sue me or the family doesn't sue me when they don't say it's 10 grand in therapy for that individual right imagine going through that well that, that, i think that I, i'd be 99 percent sure they would die um yeah because the body is just, that's not how the body works. You know, yeah. you could say, oh yeah, but you have to take vitamin supplements. Well, then it doesn't matter. Then you can't, if it fits your macros is, is debunked mm-hmm. because if you have to take a vitamin supplement, it's like veganism. If you have to take B12 supplements then veganism doesn't work. Oh, that's such a bugbear of mine as well. But there's so, so many people I know now that they'll, they'll get these like chicken free chicken breasts and all this sort of shit. <laughs> and they're going, oh, you know, I'm eating healthy. I'm like, are you, are you eating healthy? Like, what does that mean? It comes from a good place. Like I'm not saying it to be mean because 99% of people who go vegan, it comes from the place of wanting yes, to do good things for the planet, mm-hmm. wanting to do good things for their health, wanting to, you know, good things for, um, set a good example for people around them, etc. Like it comes from a good place. I, I went down that path, you know, I went significantly down that path. I was a vegetarian for nine months and then I played around with like really low protein keto for a while. Um, so it's sort of, yeah, just minimal, minimal meat and um, lots of fat and whatever. And I, both times I felt like death. Like I, I, and I, I'm lucky enough that I tend to be, I'm a bit more of a canary than a cockroach. And this is another analogy I use with players. Like, are you a canary or a cockroach? Some players can get away with just about anything, the cockroaches, and they'll survive it for five, eight, 10 years. They'll be drinking hard. They'll be living on junk food. And they've got, oftentimes they've actually got genetic momentum as well, which is an, also, an important com- uh, thing to understand, which is, explained by Weston A. Price and Price Pottinger. There's a generational decline in vitality. And after a certain period, it's, you know, there's infertility and, and, gener- and uh, it can't be reversed, but we're all somewhere on the spectrum between as vital as we can be based on the health of our ancestors, um, recent ancestors, and then to being like heavily degraded where the bone structures and the brain uh, formation, all those things are, are not where they should be. So everyone's on that spectrum somewhere. Most professional rugby players have got significant genetic momentum. So that generally means their parents have grown up in the country or they come from indigenous backgrounds where it's only been one, two, three generations of moving away from traditional values. But 
when the Polynesians move to Australia, the first generation brings all their culture with them. So they're still eating, you know, as much as they can of what they did before. Now, often the, you know, sugars and, and whatnot really, you know, become a big part of their diet as well. But with genetic momentum, you can get away with a lot more crap. And, and I've been more of a canary. I had health issues from a kid and I've always kind of had to, to watch what I was doing. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I was diagnosed with irritable bowel when I was like, 18 so if your gut's not absorbing food well then you're in deep trouble uh, i've only got one kidney as well so you know they talk about adrenal fatigue and whatever i've only got one adrenal um so i've been more sensitive probably to to stress and gut stuff and and for whatever you know now i see it as a blessing because it's allowed me to understand this stuff and experience it before everybody else does so i have a train before everybody else does if i'm not eating well or not sleeping mm-hmm. well or all those sorts of things, or at least I did in the past. I have definitely become more resilient, and I don't, I don't use it as an excuse or, or whatever for, for what what I can do. But um, yeah, there's there's a need for a different perspective on this, and I, I hope that you know it is definitely spreading. You know, first it was paleo, and that was making an impact, especially in the CrossFit community, and a mm. lot of people really mm. took a hold of that, and then keto and then carnivore. I don't care how you brand it. I don't care whether you eat some greens or you don't eat any greens or you have, you know, carbs twice a week or you don't like it doesn't, all those little details don't matter, but that ancestral health piece of like, you're meant to eat like your ancestors and all those foods are the foods that are going to give you the brain that you want and the, you know, the sexual health and vitality, the ability to reproduce and produce healthy offspring. It's not just about being able to have a child. It's also giving that child the best opportunity and the best, you know, the best health. So, if a girl is born, then they have the eggs for the next generation. So it's it's basically three generations that are, you know, being being impacted by what's going on with nutrition. And our ancestors understood this. Now, as we know more and more about less and less with all these PhDs in sports science and nutritional science, we've we've, we've zoomed in to such an extent that you know we can't see anything. And basically, Paul Quinn used to say, "Looking at the world through a straw," and that's definitely what's what's happening. In, in all sorts of areas, but nutrition is probably the one of the key ones and it's one of the most controversial ones and it's one of the mm-hmm. most heavily funded and most propaganda yeah, because it comes down right, to yeah. human vitality and human health. And, you know, we can see the, the, t- the attack on human health has been going on for a long time and now it's mm-hmm. getting to a bit more of a pointy end mm-hmm. uh, with the events of the last 12 months. Mm. I am... Um... No, I think I just quite wonder how do you think it might play out, right? Obviously, you have that climate change and and, and the misinformation or, or or information regarding deforestation, you know, like um, God, what's the cowspiracy and all these kind of narratives. But there's also a big, there is a huge commercial factor around, um, you know, kind of the, a vegan movement as well as we say it is for a good cause, right? Essentially, from a principal moral compass standpoint. I'm just curious to know where it's just going to be. And it has been. I've seen it's some sort of a vegan carnival war, you know, but it's ultimately they're just, it's just puppeteers around there, right? It's kind of, it's, it's a miss war, it, is it? <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't bought into that stuff for quite a while. Like I yeah. haven't, I guess I haven't been talking as much carnivore either. Um, but yeah, I mean, look at what's on Netflix. Look at where the commercial interest is. Like, mm-hmm. The, there's lots of stuff on Netflix supporting veganism and there's nothing supporting, you know, ancestral nutrition, paleo, keto, kind of war, and, and, and there won't be. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty clear once you start looking, but it's, it's funny because a lot of the people that are, you know, most questioning what's going on at the moment of whether it's, uh, you know, something with health or whether it's more about power and money and, and things, a lot of those people have actually they're vegan and they're questioning the system so much in that area. But then it seems like to me, they've come to a conclusion that is exactly what the mainstream view would, you know, the mainstream view of, of health. And at the moment is everything should have a vegan label on it. And, you know, all that stuff is being promoted in the, in the major supermarkets, etc. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't line up with ancestral health. It doesn't line up with Charles Poliquin's 286 Olympic medalists. Um, you can, as I said before, the power to weight ratio is key. So if, if someone goes vegan and they get really skinny, then they may well have a, a spike in performance because their power to weight ratio is there. Um, there are infinite number of cases of 
people saying, yeah, okay, I can't do that anymore. Um, I'm, I'm broken and their careers go dramatically downhill. If you look at the review on the athletes in Game Changers, um, the athletes, the full story is that they either weren't doing it or they broke before, mm. during, after. They had to keep remaking the movie because the athletes kept pulling out and you know, withdrawing the stories because it wasn't, it didn't actually work for them. So, I mean, it's, it is what it is. Like people, I want people to experiment and do whatever they want to do. Yeah. It's just about having the courage. Like I've made that, that mistake. It's about having the courage to say, well, okay, yeah, I tried that. That wasn't, that wasn't actually amazing. Like what else should we do? If, mm -hmm. you know, carnivore, some of the guys now use some honey um, to help keep electrolytes in the system. Um, mm -hmm. Origins Nutrition, Aaron McKenzie, really, really smart guy. Um, he, he got the roosters onto ancestral dieting before I was there. And then so when I was there, it was kind of already preaching to the converted with some of the more experienced players. Um, really smart guy from Bondi. He's, he's using a little bit of honey, you know, strictly not carnivore. Some people say it's an animal product because, you know, bees put it together, but it's, it's really bits of flowers. So, you know, um, who, like... For me, it's not a, I'll contradict myself and I don't have any fear of doing that. And I will tell people what I'm doing. And if it's working or if I think it's great, I'm going to tell people that. And then mm -hmm. if it stops working or whatever, I'm just going to go do whatever, you know, do whatever comes next and, and express, you know, my clarity about that. Um, generally, that's a transition towards truth. And I think, you know, Ben's been on a similar journey. He tried everything under the sun to get his, his jump, you know, better uh, in basketball and, he realized that everything that was out there wasn't getting the result that he wanted. And so he's, he's all in on sharing a different solution. And you know, there's lots and lots of people raving about it. Even, you know, even Joe Rogan saying, yeah, this actually makes sense. Just in, yeah, yeah. I think that same thing is happening in lots of different areas and we need that decentralization of knowledge and we need to question you know, question the dominant paradigm, even if it's what the research says, you know, the evidence-based, I was watching a, a lecture series about hamstrings um, yesterday because I was speaking to an athlete in Australia that's had five hamstring injuries in a row. Um, it's threatening his career. He's a young guy, superstar, and his career is being threatened by recurring hamstring injuries. It's probably, you know, there's millions of dollars on the line for him, whether he gets it right or not. And I asked him about what he's doing and to me, he's missing fundamentals. You know, he's, he's working with the top researchers in Australia, PhD scientists that are presenting. You can find their presentations on YouTube. He can't touch his toes. To me, that's a, that's a, poor, that's a poor regime. Like, it, it's nothing personal against those people. I'm sure they're trying to do their best with their research. But look at Usain Bolt. You know, if, have you watched the, the documentary with Usain Bolt? No, not yet. No, no, no. There's, there's one. I watched it on a flight once. I think it's called I Am Bolt or something. It's, yeah. it's a few years old, but it's, you can see uh, his massage therapist slash physical guy loosens his hips before every session. And you can just see how fluid his hips are, how, you know, how long his, his hamstrings and his hip flexors are. And you just can't run like he runs with your shoelaces tied together. And yet most modern strength training, oh, the studies show that, you know, we need to do a three, four times body weight trap bar deadlift. Like if, if you can do that, then you're going to have the stiffness to run really fast. Yeah, except you're looking at the world through a straw and now the athlete runs with his shoelaces tied together and now the athlete you know, tore his ACL, tore the hamstring, the career's over, but your program was research-based, so it's fine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's simple logic, like even just taking it back to kids. You know, my kids, can they can move, they can stretch, they can lay down on the floor in all sorts of funky positions that professional athletes can't. They can get it straight out of bed jump up on the table, jump down on the hard floor, body weight, depth jump, you know, body height, depth jump, yeah. zero concerns, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, we should be training athletes to be, have more childlike capacity mm -hmm. and, and, and we're not. So I'm, I'm jumping from topic to topic here, but there are examples of where the dominant paradigm is not good enough. And we, you know, we have to experiment with other things and have the courage to, to go, you know, to not be evidence-based, basically. Um, doesn't mean don't look at the research. I love looking at the research. Charles mm -hmm. was a huge fan, but sometimes it was three decades behind what he was saying that mm -hmm. the research said, oh yeah, cluster training, a novel method. It was published as a novel method, like just a few years ago, cluster training. He'd been doing it since the seventies and it traces back to the, the 60s or the fifties. I think cluster training was actually invented. So by the time there's a study for it, there may never be a study. There may never be a, a study on 
you know, carnival diet or, you know, some of these things. So, so linking with this, with, um, say, I say that you're kind of questioning philosophy and trying to, you know, be that, that, that top percentile. And I would say disruptive, I would say questioning things within the sector across, you know, uh, health, well-being, uh, financially constructs and kind of leads into where you are geographically right now. Okay. So you're living in Sark and this kind of is a big financial freedom focus within all these other, uh, the umbrella of everything. Um, yep. I'm intrigued to, yeah, to know. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where is Sark for people that don't know as well? Just off the coast of France, just next to Guernsey. Um, so it's about the same height as Paris in terms of the, uh, mm -hmm. where it sits in the world. But um, yeah, basically we decided to leave Australia. Um, I have an online business and it doesn't make sense to me to support um, the system that exists in Australia at the moment. I didn't really believe in it. I didn't really believe in it when I left in 2004 or five. And then as I traveled, I didn't want to live there ever again, really like as a lot of, I guess, rebellious backpackers and, and teens and early twenties, people kind of feel about where they come from when they go and live somewhere else. Um, I didn't ever want to live there again. I only went back there because the rooster's job seemed like a really good opportunity. And then we had a child and, you know, we lived on North Coast New South Wales. It was nice, but um, yeah, we decided to leave. And then that was when COVID hit, you know, so we'd, we'd sold our house and, you know, sold all our possessions and, and got everything organized. We left Australia. We came to Europe for that event with you and Sonny. And um, I went to Georgia, you know, setting up structures and getting organized with, like an international business structure, I paid a consultant to work with to understand how to do it all. And then, uh, you know, went to America with Ben and then we went back to Australia, just did an event. And then we we're off to Bali and back to, back to um, probably settle in Costa Rica. We hadn't fully decided, but we're thinking we're going to live in Costa Rica or Mexico as our base. So we're nice and close to the U S easy enough to get to Europe. Um, and then, yeah, COVID hit and, you know, Costa Rica pretty much had its borders shut and they, they really went pretty hard with like not letting, Nicaragua and Panama kind of transverse, which is massive in Central Central American kind of logistics. Anyway, Costa Rica suddenly didn't look quite as attractive. And so we were looking and we were like basically homeless. We were stuck in Australia. Australia said you can't leave um, to all Australian citizens. And so if you have an Australian citizenship, even if you have dual citizenship, the rule was you can't leave. Um, I valued freedom and valued, you know, um, Free thinking, free free movement, you know, freedom is, is a core value, making decisions for yourself. So the government saying that didn't really sit that well with me. So we had to apply to leave Australia, you know, basically get an exit visa. So at the time, Eritrea, Cuba, uh, North Korea and Australia were the only countries that required an exit visa. Um, I think other countries are kind of getting to that point now, but we applied for a permit to leave and we received that permit and... Um, yeah, we, we were looking for a place to live. So it popped up that there's an island in Europe um, that has a set tax rate um, that is yeah, just, you know, basically Western European style of living um, that we could go and, and, and move to. And it just seemed like a, a good idea. <laughs> I guess I'm uh, it's a bit like doing the carnivore diet. Like to a lot of people, it probably seems nuts, but to me, it was like, yeah, that, that makes sense. That, that's the next logical step. Um, so I thought, yeah, we'll just go try it out and then we'll see how it goes. And so far, yeah, so far, so good. We've been here maybe five months. There are yeah. a lot of other people who are questioning things, who have different perspectives on the world, who've, who've come and lived here too. So that's great. There's some great, you know, entrepreneurial sort of guys. There's crypto guys. There's investors. Um, you basically you have to be financially independent that's the thing like I moved to a country with no welfare at a time where pretty much everyone's receiving welfare uh, I said yeah okay that's I've got to get away from that um, so you know there's no welfare system here so if you can't support yourself then you have to go live somewhere else or go to a country that's going to you know look after you um, but I don't I don't really want that safety net I want I want to you know, do my best by myself and, and sort of for my family and it's not having a go at people who've had face-to-face -face businesses because I know gyms have been really, you know, they've been basically under attack. The places that are centers of health and where people feel, you know, empowered and improve their health and vitality have been most under attack during a health crisis, which is, is interesting in itself. Um, but, you know, for, for me, like doing what, you know, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first and put your own life jacket on first. You know, that's the, the instruction. The only time you're told to be selfish in the world, really in the modern time is, is then. And, 
Yeah. I do think that that is important information. And financially, every coach should do that. Like if you're in an empowered position financially, then you have much more opportunity you know, to, to, to influence the world um, positively. So that was the decision I made in 2019. And I've, I've followed through on that decision mm-hmm. fairly well. Um, still more to go, but yeah, it's been a good journey too. Yeah, fair, definitely friend in the deep end. And so what, we've obviously touched on ACG coaches and, and, and that, that program. What is, what's like, what's next? What's the goal with that? What's your kind of goal next three to five years? Like what do you throw out there? Like what's the, what's the big, the big dream? I was, so the, the problem we had, Sam, was like we decided we want to help athletes be better and humans like to have a better experience of their body. When I decided that, who do you go and learn from? Like, if you want to be an engineer, you want to build skyscrapers, there's a clear path to that. If you want to build apps, there's a clear path to that. You can even get a lot of people investing in you. And there's even, you know, there's all sorts of support to go and do that. But if your goal is to make the human experience better, then how do you go and do that? If you, if you want to work with the worst condition of humans who've just been run over by a bus or, you know, can't find a way to live or they're on death's door, then there's a system you can go and learn to deal with those people. Yeah. But if you just want to work with normal people and help them to thrive, then there really isn't a very good system that you can plug yourself into. Um, I think Paul Check and Charles Poliquin and some of these guys have done some of the best things. You know, you might have another brand or two that pops to mind, but there's very little. You know, you, you listen to Joe Rogan podcast and then you hold on for for, for dear life. You know, that's what a lot of people, I think, <laughs> a lot of men are doing. You know, like it's a fair point. Um, yeah. But we need we need an alternative to that, you know, and that's that's what I've been trying to create with real movement, like where these people set up hubs. So every every city in the world, there's somewhere where you can go where you know that people are positive, they want to improve their health, they want to train hard, and they want to you know they want to do well for themselves. Like the financial side's become clearer since I I understood I finally understood what financial stress was in you know, sort of 2019 after I I never wanted to have it, so I lived super poor as a backpacker and whatever and just got by and didn't didn't mind. But at some point there, I had that financial stress and, oh, this is what everybody's talking about. This is what everyone's worrying about. Like, let's not do this. Like, let's come up with another way of, of you know, dealing with money. And mm-hmm. I found someone who's an amazing mentor. You know, the Charles Poliquin of money is um, is my personal mentor as well now. And that's, you know, that's, that's been fun too, um, to, to deal with him. It's not financial advice because no one's allowed to give financial advice just because you can't give nutritional advice. Um, but it, it teaches people a new philosophy of, of how to deal with um you know, building business and, and what to do with the money after that um, to some extent as well. But um, yeah, the goal is to, for, for there to be a coach, you know, lots of coaches in every city where someone's like, oh, my body doesn't work that well. I, I go there. Like, what do you do at the moment? You can go to CrossFit, but, you know, some people call CrossFit a meat grinder as well. Like there, mm-hmm. there, are, there, there are great coaches in CrossFit and it does work really well in a certain way for certain people. But ultimately, it's a sport. Powerlifting is a sport. Strongman is a sport. Bodybuilding is a sport. None of them are, are for humans to, to thrive, even, you know, jujitsu or taekwondo or parkour or whatever. They all kind of become a sport where we just need a system of training that helps anyone to be able to experience their body well, to be able to run. Like, is it a good test is, you know, are you hard to kill? Um, and <clears throat> most training systems make it easier to kill, actually, because, you, you know, you do a lot of weight training and then you can't really move like you could when you were a kid. <laughs> yeah. I've been there. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. So that's the, that's the goal, man. It's just to have someone all over the place, you know, so a, a great coaches where if someone realizes, yeah, like a time to change, like I really need some, some positivity in my life. I want to start that with physical expression. Um, then I want there to be a, a local place for people to go to to get that result. That was the goal with Thrill Movement, and that's exactly yep. the outcome with, with ATG. So now we have a clearer physical training system. I think that's going to make it much more clear and tangible for coaches to be able to turn it you know, directly into, into a business, whether they're applying that within a CrossFit box or within a commercial facility or with mm-hmm. a professional sporting team. I, I would like to see this system infiltrate every professional sporting team. It is to an extent at the moment, but it, for the most part, it's watered down, you know, um, I'm, you know, yeah, working with guys in lots of different professional organizations, um, athletes and a few coaches. And yeah, I really think that we're going to see like a new age of, of human, you know, human performance, physical training. Like, uh, I think it's just like the, the transition from the, 
you know, the, the Nokia to the, to the smartphone, um, from the horse and cart to the combustion engine, like it's just better technology. And I think once coaches actually look at what I'm talking about with this, is it a structurally dominant exercise, is it anabolic exercise, is it something that's going to remodel the connective tissue or is it a muscular exercise? Is it going to you know, cause primarily neural adaptations? Um, once you understand the differentiation, you're in a different position for the rest of your, your coaching career. Um, and then if you add to that, the extended sort of taking that to the extreme of positions, uh, it just get, it's just better, you know, and I've seen it over and over and that's that's why it's going viral like it's literally built on the back of results all these coaches are looking for click funnels and facebook campaigns and investing all this money in business coaching it's like first thing you have to have an amazing product if you have an amazing product then cool turn the ads on turn them you know learn get a get a good page together but often now it's happening the other way around a coach gets their certificate automatically yeah, they put their online training on their bio and they're away and then they're frustrated of like why is no one coming to me so they go and buy business education yeah. it's like the market's not as dumb as you think like people have tried crossfit they've tried f45 they've tried everything now yeah it needs to change you know like we need a legit system so there's an alternative to going to university there's an alternative to you know i'm, I'm on board with crossfit and powerlifting and all that stuff it just needs the physical underpinning where you know what a human needs and then you plug that specific ability and on top of that like that's that's really what i'll yeah if, if the world understands that five years from now then it'll be a good next podcast <laughs> <laughs> no fair well mate i have uh it's been a pleasure thank you uh where great. can where can people reach you personally and work-wise and yeah so uh keganSmith.coach instagram is kind of probably the feedback loop that works best for people who want to chat with me about something um, and at ATG for coaches uh, for in letters and it's the, the new Instagram for the for the new coach education so that's probably the two best ways new websites and such to follow but the links will the links will be there so nice uh, well, yeah I appreciate you guys thing? having me what's on cool? and uh, you know you obviously want to yeah, you guys are doing your part. Everyone's got to do their part to to kind of make a difference and improve the way that athletes are being trained, the way that everyday Joes are experiencing their human body. I know you've both made significant changes in your own lives. And that's, I think that's the biggest thing. You know, that's if you're doing that, then that has a flow on effect. And I, I'm still, I still uh, believe that we're on the verge of a golden age. You know, of decentralized information, freedom. You know, positivity. I think that we're, we're really on the verge of that. And that's why there's a challenge time is because we're really, really close to that. And not everybody's on board with that, but um, you know, we can do it in the physical. And I think the physical is a great place to start with, with truth and with experiences. Like, you, you know, this is, you know, this is real, you know, this is working. So, you know, what else? Um, so yeah, I appreciate you, you guys, you know, your part in that and supporting me with, with my endeavors as well. Oh, all good, man. Well, hopefully we'll have a, a cup of uh, pig foot stew together yeah. at some, <laughs> some point in the future. I'll yeah, yeah. I hope you get, get to Sark soon, you know, and I, yeah. I definitely plan to be in the UK. It's just, uh, you know, uh, there's there's barriers at the moment that yeah. will they'll go away at some stage. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, yeah. The armband's on. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of talk about getting a boat um you know that might be the <laughs> yeah, yeah i can see you now pirate hat on <laughs> got the family got the kids just sound the horn <laughs> it's not out of the question at all it's not out of the question at all sam <laughs> i don't doubt that well thank you very much man and um yeah it's been a great pod i really enjoyed that's been really inf informative um perfect thank i appreciate thanks, your time thanks, kicks. Thanks. Everyone, like, subscribe, share. Have a good day. Peace. Do it.